But I think you're right. I think it's sort of like if I were running a big organization, thank God I'm not, I would be really alive to this problem that a lot of what I need to know doesn't find its way to me naturally. There are all these barriers coming up the chain before it gets to me. And I need to find ways to open up those barriers. And you could call it flattening the organization, whatever. But, but the truth is, especially in corporate America, the way we behave does not, does not encourage this. I'm Chris Hill, and that's best-selling author Michael Lewis. I caught up with him for an episode in May of 2022 talking about his excellent podcast, Against the Rules. But there was stuff from that conversation we had to leave out last time that we wanted to share today, including a closer look at his book Moneyball and the takeaways that were lost. It's Michael Lewis telling stories. There's no one better. I like the fact that I think the first episode of season three, you you play an audio clip of a radio interview from when you're on a book tour for Liars Poker 30 <laughs> plus years ago. And you're, you know, you were getting these questions sort of demonstrating. It reminded me of a, a friend of mine who's a financial analyst and he had done a, a, a television live hit of some sort. And I asked him how it went and he just sort of smiled and said, you know, it was great. Do you know why? And I said, no, why? And he said, because they called me an expert. It's the only place in my life anyone ever calls me an expert. <laughs> He's like, I, my wife doesn't think I'm an expert. My kids don't think I'm an expert. But if I go on television, they call me an expert. And you're on TV because you're an expert. You're on TV for two, for two actually contradictory reasons. You're the ability to hold you for the television people to hold you out as an expert and your willingness to be sound completely certain about something you don't know anything about or it's, or something that you're co- to be completely certain about something that you know maybe you know something about but not everything about and the the there is this um you know you every time i go on book tour this happens people want me to come on like cable news and talk about stuff that I don't know anything about it. It's not about, I happen to have a book out about X, but they want me to talk about Y, Z and and A and B. And, uh, and I'll say, look, I don't really know anything about that. And that's not the answer they want to hear. What they want to hear is happy to, I got to take, uh, you know, I, I'll give you, I, I, I can answer that question. Me, 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 me. But I would say, you know, I was kicking around with the producers after the, we just finished the last episode of this season, which will air in a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. Um, uh, they're dropping one a week, but and we were sitting this kind of shooting the shit about what this was all about. And one of the producers says, you know, if we had to summarize this whole season in a sense, it would be, you can recognize the expert because he or she is the one who is not totally certain and is really quick to say, I don't know <laughs> that, and that you could, and if you want to find the person who actually doesn't really know what they're talking about, look for total certainty and look for people who don't admit they don't know things. Um, but, and TV just isn't friendly to that. TV doesn't want you on TV saying, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Why are you on TV then? Um, and this, so this is, we opened with those clips from Liars Poker because I said to them, uh, you know, as we were starting the thing, I said, you know, it could not be a more a clear cut example of the problems we have in our media environment with presenting expertise to people to the public that i the whole book of the whole of liars poker was it was like a dramatization of my ignorance a dramatization of if you're going to listen to anybody about money don't make it be me i i clearly don't know what i'm talking about and that that these interviewers over and over are saying like uh which way is the stock market going or where should I, what should I invest in now? Or it was just, it was, it was, it was a madness. Anyway, so that's what we open with that, but we quickly get to uh, the subject at hand in, in that one. But you just touched on another theme that runs through some of your books, um, and it's the role that confidence plays, for better or for worse. And it shows up in this season um, as sort of the intersection of confidence and expertise. And as you said, you know, throughout the season of this podcast, we meet people who have great expertise and they are almost shy about it. And then there are people who have great confidence um, despite their complete lack of expertise. So, so two examples, one specific, one general. Episode three, I think, 
uh, goes back to the Moneyball material. It goes back to Bill James, who is the the he's the reason for Moneyball. He's the first he's the first person who, in a big way, to a, um, a largest audience, is rethinking the game of baseball in the '70s and '80s, and is 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 sort of showing really clearly that professional baseball people. Don't, aren't making any sense that, that in the way they're valuing players and the way they're thinking about strategies that there's a there's a fresh take on all this and he says then that he looks at a baseball field and what he sees is a field of ignorance um now which so, we go back to him because i because it's so interesting to see this man who spawned a revolution who you know who has every reason to like hold himself out as the world's greatest expert on baseball, the greatest thinker who ever, who ever thought about the game. Um, we go back to him, and one, he's really uneasy with the idea that he is the expert because he's much more comfortable with the idea that we actually still don't know a lot. And it really bothers him the way mo that Moneyball has become, has created this illusion of certainty about and uh, about the knowledge of, around the game. That this is sort of this illusion of precision that has be all become very quantitative, very analytical. It has gotten smarter. They have learned things, but his point is that the people who are now the experts, it's a different kind of person here than it used to be. It's no longer it's no longer it used to be the old baseball scout who had, who played the person who had experience in the game. It's now the person who has analytical abilities. So the person's changed. He says the attitude hasn't changed as much as he would have hoped. And that back in the day, when Bill James was first making, saying things about baseball that were just shockingly true and revolutionary, you could see, you could see it. He says, he says, you know, why was I able to do this? Like, why was a total outsider able to make this sort of contribution to the understanding of the game? He said, because the insiders thought they knew. They'd stop thinking altogether. Why did they stop thinking? Because they thought they knew. And he said, that's the thing that bothered him the most, that I think I know. I'm totally sure. And he sees the same streak in people who now occupy, not ever, all of them, but front offices, where they, they are they're very clever, they're highly educated, they do have answers to some things, but they are excessively sure about what they know. It bothers him a lot, and it, and so his he's maintained it's very interesting through whatever it is fifty years forty forty five years fifty years even as he was integrated into the game and his thinking was integrated into the game he's preserved this distance and this humility it's a really deep humility like he points to the field and he says that's still a field of ignorance and we need to respect what we don't know and don't and don't pretend we know things we don't know so there's kind of one example like. If anybody's going to be an expert, Bill James would be an expert. Uh, the second is like the episode that we released today is um, is about the role of male overconfidence in this great problem of like why doesn't knowledge and people knowledgeable people actually reach the audience it needs to reach, and it it starts with the, the phenomenon of mansplaining, and it's kind of great. It starts with the story with, with the, the um, writer Rebecca Solman. This is where the, the, the mansplaining gets coined back in the early 2000s. She's at a dinner party in Snowmass, Colorado. She's been invited, but she doesn't actually know the host. It's a lot of old, rich, important people. She's a youngish writer. She's written seven books. Uh, the host ignores her the whole, the whole party. And at the end, he comes over and he says, oh, so I understand you've written a couple of books. And she'd written seven books, but she said, I've written, yes, I've written a couple of books. She says, what's your book so about? What are your books about? She said, well, the most recent is about the photographer, Edward Moybridge. And he says, ah, there's a very important new Edward Moybridge book out that you need to know all about. And he starts to talk at great length about this book that he clearly hasn't read. He's just read some review of, and she knows he hasn't read it because she wrote it. It's her book. And she, he's explaining her book to her. And she, she, she sits and listens. She realizes this has happened to her over and over in her life. This man is talking to her as a, a presenting himself as the expert on the subject of Edward Moybridge and everything he knows is a review of her book. So anyway, she sits on this for like a couple of years, I think, before she writes this essay, which she calls Men Explain Things to Me. And someone reads that their essay and, say, and coins the, the word mansplaining. And it's sort of like, what's at the bottom of this? And we go from there to 
like where you find mail over confidence and what are its consequences. And you know, one place that where it's been pretty, pretty uh, fantastically uh, sort of dramatized is in the stock market. Do you know Terry O'Dean's uh, and Brad Barber's paper "Boys Will Be Boys"? Does that have you ever have you as the as the fool run across this? About, uh, about I'm sure my company has. I'm familiar uh, uh, let me, with let me, references let me, let me to it, but I haven't read it. Need, this audience should know about this paper. Around the time Rebecca Solnit is being mansplained to in Snow, Snowmass, Colorado, these two guys, economists, are working on this subject, and they've gotten access to um, data from one of the big online brokerage firms. They never say which one. And um, th so they can see how, how the accounts performed. And they, they carve all the accounts uh, at this online brokerage firm into three buckets. Accounts run by, in households with just a single man, accounts with a household with just a single woman, and accounts with a household that have a man and a woman in it. And they see, well, how do, so how did the various households perform? And, and the the house with a single guy in it is the worst. It, he underperforms. He underperforms the house with a single woman in it by one point four percent a year, which sounds like you know not much, but you compound that over a lifetime of trading, and it's forever, right? It's a huge sum of money, and they kind of get it why this is happening, and why it's why it's happening is the men are trading the single guy. Is trading way too much. He's just like he's he's churning. He's churning because he thinks he knows something. He says like, oh, it's doing. I, I it's a smart move to buy IBM today, whatever it is. And he's paying. He's bleeding commissions, and he's also his judgments are no better than the market. But he doesn't know it. And it, it, it's like it's like a distillation of the problem of male overconfidence in the marketplace. And I don't know. I've seen this over and over in, in my in my writing life. Um, I mean. One way to describe the financial crisis of 2008 is a byproduct of male overconfidence. And in fact, I wrote a piece once, one of my favorite pieces of material, sort of chunks of material I ever got handed, about what happened in Iceland during the financial crisis. Because in Iceland, is this, it's like this really, this, it's this great little laboratory because it's only 350,000 people. It's like the size of Peoria, Illinois, but, and they're all related to one another. So they all kind of know each other. And so you can't really fool anybody. After the financial crisis, uh, the Iceland, the women of Iceland turned to the men and they said, you know, five years ago, you said you were going to stop fishing and become a banker because we, we Icelandic men are more gifted in financial markets than anybody on earth, that our Viking heritage has left us predisposed to being financial wizards. And so you built three of the, the three of the biggest and most risky banks in the world, three big banks in Peoria, Illinois, basically. Uh, and they've all come crashing down and this ruined our society. And when I walked into this, the women had figured out, this is male overconfidence at work, that they elected a prime minister, they kicked out the prime minister who was a guy. They elected a, a, a female prime minister who said, no more men in the banks. The only functioning money management firm in Iceland at the time was run by a woman. And her, her selling point, which she, her marketing was simply, if you give me your money to manage, I promise no man will ever touch it. <laughs> and, uh, and it worked. Men were giving her money because they didn't want men to touch the money. And it's kind of, so... Anyway, this, the financial sector provides us with examples of the idiocy of male overconfidence and how it gets in the way of perhaps deep understanding. It's one example of a larger phenomenon. And the final speaks to our whole season, which is like, all right, why is it so hard for the, ex the real expert to be heard? One of the reasons is people who don't know are shouting very loudly. Let me do this before I finish, because when you start poking at this, you can't believe how deeply it runs. We interview a woman, female doctor, who is on a plane, like some commercial flight. Some dude gets up, you know, collapses in the aisle, heart attack, stroke, nobody knows what it is, but it's like, he's out. The, the flight attendant gets on the horn and says, any doctors here? She raises her hand, the guy is prone, you know, next to her really, and says, I'm a doctor. The flight attendant comes back, looks at her, sees a guy who's behind her who says, I, I have some nursing experience <laughs> and picks the guy to come and work. And she says, wait, wait, I'm a doctor. And, and she said, like the flight attendant looked and said, 
you're a doctor? How curious. But didn't it? So, 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 so wait a minute. It gets better. She thinks like, well, that was weird. This guy was dying, you know, could be dying at my feet. I'm a doctor. I was actually trained in ways that were exactly suited to dealing with this particular problem. And nobody ever acknowledged that I might be the one. Instead, they picked this guy to, who knew less to come and service this poor man. Uh, but she thinks like that was just a weird thing, a one off until she stumbles on Facebook into a group of doctors, female doctors, all of whom have had the same experience on airplanes. And there are lady doctors who've been ignored on airplanes for, in favor of some guy. And the, and the sort of invisible female on doc, doctor on a plane, to me, it's like a little metaphor for the problem. Anyway, I'm blathering on, but I tell you, I can tell you that the, that the podcast generally has been a joy to kind of like explore things that I might not otherwise explore in print. And t it is just taken us places that I just might not otherwise go. And this was one of them. So you, when you think about expertise being hidden, um, this is something that comes up in the very first episode of the season, an episode called Six Levels Down. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have a couple of questions about it. Um, but before that, for people who have not yet listened to the episode, and I can't encourage people enough to do so, can you give a summary of what the episode explores? Because six levels down, I listened to that episode twice, and the second time through, I thought about it just from the standpoint of investing. And I feel like it is, it is an episode that every CEO of every public company should listen to. Yeah, it's the phenomenon. So what we're describing, I'll tell you what the general thing is, and I'll tell you the specific story. The general idea was, and it is an idea that I stumbled across while I was working on the most recent book on the premonition, that in a complicated society, in, in complicated systems, a big corporation, a federal government agency, a state government, whatever it is, a big system, when there is a crisis or a problem, the person who has the expertise to respond to that, the answer to the question, uh, is very seldom the person who's like running the operation. Very seldom the person underneath that person. That often it's someone who's you know six levels down on the organization chart who has a very specific knowledge. In some ways, this is some, this is revealing something that is generally true about expertise. It's it's kind of quiet and local. Like people who really know something are spending their time knowing, learning about that thing and not advertising their expertise, not, not, not being big picture people. They're little picture people. So you need, you need to find the right little picture person six levels down in your organization to answer the question that happens. And the, the story that we, the idea was introduced to me by an entrepreneur who also public servant, a fellow named Todd Park. Extraordinary character. He's formed. He, he's created three different multi-billion-dollar companies in healthcare. Um, he was the s chief technology officer for the United States, brought in by Obama, and dealt with multiple crises at the federal government. And he was filling my ear about this while I was working on the premonition. I stumbled in, into him when I was working on the book. At the mo at that moment, he was looking for the expertise to help Ga Ga Governor, Ga Governor Gavin Newsom in California figure out how to respond to COVID back in March of 2020. And he found it six levels down in the California state government. And that woman he found happened to be the main character of the book. But leave that to one side. I, I was talking to him, I said, well, how did you even know to go looking in the bowels of the state government for this particular for pandemic expertise? He said, well, Michael, he said my whole career, entire career, has been premised on this on this understanding. And I myself only accidentally came across this understanding. He was 24, 25 years old, fresh out of the Harvard Business School. He was like a McKinsey consultant, wanted to start his own business, uh, formed a business with a friend. And the idea for the business was, we're gonna make pregnancy better for women and reduce catastrophic outcomes, make the whole thing, care for the mom better from, from conception to birth, and it will actually reduce reduce health healthcare costs because they will have been so well taken care of that they're not going to be the bad really bad outcomes at the end. And they buy a clinic, a pregnancy, a maternity clinic in um, San Diego to to try their idea out. It's a it's a disaster. 
nobody, the healthcare firms don't want to, insurers don't want to pay for like preventative care. Uh, you know, nobody gets the idea. And, however, while they're managing this disaster, losing like a million dollars a year uh, on this clinic, they realize that, oh, there's this other problem. Uh, the, health, the health clinic we bought is losing all this money because it's not even getting paid for the stuff it's doing by insurance companies because the insurance billing has gotten so complicated that like half our bills are just rejected because we put the wrong item on the wrong line. And they, they, they realize, oh, we're in the wrong business. We need to be in the business of figuring out how to get doctors and hospitals paid. And it turns out it's like a cr national crisis at that time. It's like the 1990s insurance complexity is exploding. There are like 18 different healthcare plans in, in uh, 50 different insurance companies, and each one has all these permutations on it. Everybody's having trouble getting paid. They find, they go casting around for someone who knows how to get hospitals paid. And they find literally in the basement of a big hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, a woman named Sue Henderson, who's in her 50s, and who is the, the littlest picture person you ever met, who knows more about how to, it's not game, how to solve the game that the health insurers have created to get people paid than anybody on the planet. And they essentially try to code all of her knowledge into software, and they do. And this business becomes Athena Health, which is a monster. Now, you know, they end up selling it for $5 billion. But Susan Anderson was literally six levels down in the hospital on the hospital organization chart and she had the only person in the whole operation who had the answers to the question that that if the hospital doesn't answer they go out of business and even the hospital did not appreciate what they like what they had or her knowledge so the episode is exploring this it's you know the l he calls it the l6 the the l6s of the world the people who who have this sort of critical a, 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 some sort of critical understanding of a problem and who have real trouble for odd reasons being heard so that I know one last other examples is this so Todd Tom Parker has it when he gets to the White House he has this career of like looking for the person who knows the answer to the question buried in the organization he gets there uh, right as Obamacare is cratering I don't know if you remember but the, the right the, the the legislation gets passed and then the website, the website yes yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was the biggest public relations disaster in the Obama presidency. It was just like, how did that happen? They worked so hard to get this thing passed. And and the website crashes. So Todd goes in, chief technology officer, what the hell happened? And he knows, like, the secretary of the department's not going to know, the undersecretary's not going to know. So he just went right down to a, a contractor who is, again, I think he was seven levels down from the top, who actually had an answer to what was wrong with the software. And they fix the software. But I think you're right. I think it's sort of like if I were running a big organization, thank God I'm not, I would be really alive to this problem that a lot of what I need to know doesn't find its way to me naturally. There are all these barriers coming up the chain before it gets to me. And I need to find ways to open up those barriers. And you could call it flattening the organization, whatever. But, but the truth is, especially in corporate America, the way we behave does not does not encourage this. I mean, if it, just with like pay, like you got a CEO who's being paid like fifty million dollars a year, that is not a person who the, the L six is going to feel comfortable dialing up and saying, "I can fix your problem." Uh, that it's it's the status differences are so great. Or put it another way, the greater the status differences that you introduce in your organization between L one and L six the less likely the L6, the critical things that the L6 knows is going to find its way to the L1. It's just going to be the status differences end up being barriers to understanding. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.